Hey everybody, and welcome back to another Farming Simulator 25 Tips and Tricks video. We're continuing our series of chatting with NPCs, and this video is all about my year spending time chatting it up with Katie here down at the Animal Dealer. She's got lots of interesting stories, some interesting myths and legends about the local area, and, well, information about how to care for animals, of course. So, again, this collection is going to be everything that she had to say for me over the last game year. Oh, hi. You're Walter's grandkid, aren't you? I'm Katie. Nice to meet you. Hi, Katie. Nice to meet you, too. Let me welcome you to our small town. As I just said, I'm Katie. I took over my parents' farm four years ago, continuing the family business after traveling the world as one does. But... I'll tell you all about that another time. I was wondering, getting the lay of the land. I was wondering, getting the lay of the land. That's good. I specialize in livestock. We got chickens, cows, sheep, pigs, horses, even bees. Also our recent additions, goats and water buffaloes. It's quite an eclectic ensemble of creatures, if I can say so myself. If you want to dip your toes into animal husbandry, come to me. I'm not only dealing with the livestock, I can also give you important advice. I've been working with animals all my life, you see. Even when traveling the world, I occupied myself with the local fauna. And I collected some stories on the way, if you're interested sometime. That and some myths and legends. Maybe I should start a podcast. Anyway, I'm sure you and I have got stuff to do, animals to feed, and so on. So don't let me keep you. I'm sure we'll have time to talk again. Hey there, what can I do for you? Can I help you with something? Thanks, but right now I have everything under control myself. Hello, hello. I need help with animal husbandry. Ask away, friend. Help for what? Beekeeping. How do I feed bees? That's the neat thing about bees. You don't need to feed your bees, as bees feed off pollen. Just place your hive next to flowers. But there is a trick to the whole beekeeping stuff. If you have a beehive, place it next to a field of canola, sunflowers, or potatoes, and the yield of your next harvest will increase. How do I keep bees? Bees are quite different from your usual farm animals. You don't buy one bee like you would with a cow. You buy bee hives with the whole colony. If you're a stickler and want to buy only a specific number of bees, you can count them yourself and put them into the hive with your bare hands. <laughs> Place the hives and a pallet station somewhere on your farm and enjoy the fruits of their labor when you're done. What equipment do I need? Beekeeping is quite easy. After you've got yourself a beehive with a colony, you only need a tractor with a front loader attacher and a pallet fork. Use the pallet fork to transport the honey. Oh, and you need a pallet station. With buying a beehive, you get our special package. This includes a lifelong service of honey extraction. So one of our workers will extract the honey from your hives and place the honey on your pallet station. You do not need to do anything, and it is completely free of charge. Aren't you lucky? Where do I place hives? One of the many great things about bees is the little buzzers will increase the yield of certain crops. For example, the yield of sunflowers, potatoes, and canola will increase if hives are placed in the vicinity of the fields. As for the pallet station to collect the honey, place it wherever it fits your farm layout. Chickens. What's the difference between chickens or roosters? Usually you need a chicken and a rooster to reproduce, as they are a, well, special breed that you can only buy from me. You don't need a rooster for reproduction. But my skills also have their limits. If you want some eggs, you still have to buy chickens. Roosters won't do that for you. How do I feed chickens? Chicken like grains. So you can feed them wheat, barley, or sorghum. You can also buy chicken feed. 
How do I keep chickens? Chickens are best kept in a pasture or coop. Choose the size of the housing depending on your bank account and how many chickens you want to keep. What equipment do I need? You definitely want a pasture or coop, as chickens like to roam. All of our special chickens are directly delivered to your pasture or coop, so you don't need to worry about transport. First, you get yourself a tractor with a front loader attacher and a pallet fork to take care of the animals. Use the pallet fork to transport the fodder to the barn and then the eggs to your truck. To make transport easier, you may want to own a pickup truck to load the pallets onto. You can, of course, deliver them with the tractor and pallet fork. That's all you need to keep chickens. Cows? What are the different kinds of breeds? Okay, as you may have noticed, there are a few different kinds of cows. Brown Swiss and Holstein, for example, are dairy cows. At the age of 18 months, they start producing milk. Angus and Limousin breeds, for example, do not produce any milk. They are only used for breeding and selling for a profit. At 18 months, they start reproducing. How do I feed cows? You can feed your cows with grass, hay, or TMR. To keep your cows healthy and increase productivity, you shouldn't only feed them hay or grass. I've had the best results with TMR. If your farm relies heavily on milk production, especially in the winter, you should always prepare enough quality food for them so they can be as productive as possible. How do I keep cows? Cows, like all of your animals, need a pasture or barn, depending on how much you'd like to spend and how many cows you want to keep. If you want to produce slurry or manure, you need at least a cow barn to collect it. You need to deliver fresh water to your cow pasture, as it has no access to water. After placing one of the pastures or barns, you can shape the area of the outdoor enclosure. What kind of equipment do I need? Well, you definitely want a pasture or barn. Cows on your field are not good for your yield. If you have laid straw in the barn, the cows will produce manure, and that must be stored. Get yourself a manure heap. Cows produce slurry, too. It's collected in the liquid manure tank. If you want to spread manure and slurry on your fields, you need to buy a spreader and tank for each of the brown goods. Get yourself a tractor with a front loader attachment and a bale spike to deliver bales to the barn, as you need those to feed the cattle. Then, you should get yourself a tank to transport milk and water. Depending on the housing situation, you may need a forage mixing wagon to mix the TMR. Goats. How do I feed goats? Feeding goats is quite simple. They like hay or grass. That's it. Just unload it at the feeding area of your barn or pasture. If you are growing grass on your fields, you can feed them fresh grass during the summer. And for the cold winter months, you can use hay. How do I keep goats? Goats are quite rewarding animals to keep. They produce goat milk. Oh, and they are very fluffy. Goats need a pasture or a barn. Choose the size of the housing, depending on how much you'd like to spend and how many goats you want to keep. You need to deliver fresh water to your goat pasture, as it has no access to water. So after placing one of the pastures or barns, you can shape the area of the outdoor enclosure. If you need slurry or manure, you can keep pigs or cows, as goats don't produce any. What kind of equipment do I need? Like I said, you definitely want a pasture or barn, as you don't want those hungry fellows to decimate your hard work. <laughs> First, you get yourself a tractor with a front loader attachment and a bale spike to deliver bales to the barn as you need those to feed your woolly friends. If you got yourself a goat pasture, you need a tank for refilling the watering place. If you don't want to use my delivery service, you should buy a transporter. If you buy a large one, you might need a dolly to use it with a tractor. Otherwise, you need a truck. Should you choose to process your milk into dairy products, you'll need a tank for transportation. That is all. It doesn't sound so bad, right? Oh, that was terrible. Horses. How do I feed horses? It's not that hard. You feed your horses with a mix of base food and a supplement. You can use oat or sorghum as a base food and hay as a supplement. And that's it. 
Of course, you can also only feed them the base food or supplement, but I've had the best luck with feeding both. That's why I would recommend 60% base food and 40% supplement. How do I keep horses? Depending on how much you'd like to spend and how many horses you want to keep, you have a few options. Pastures, barns, and large barns. While a horse pasture requires you to provide feed and water and houses only a few horses, the barns only require you to provide feed and have enough space for breeding. Thankfully, the mares miraculously birth full-grown horses. Aren't we lucky? We really have the best, strongest horses around here. How do I sell horses? In order to sell them, you need to take care of your horses. This includes daily rides, a good diet, and some affection can never hurt. You can sell your horses at your stable, or transport them to the buyer. And that's basically all you need to do. What's the difference between the multiple breeds? We have a variety of breeds. Gray, Pinto, Palomino, Chestnut, Bay, Black, Seal, Brown, and Dunn. For you, there is no difference between the different breeds, except the visual part. What equipment do I need? You need a pasture or a barn to keep your horses in one place. As my uncle says, always keep your horses in a row. First, you need to get yourself a tractor with a front loader attachment and a bale spike to deliver bales to the barn, as you need those to feed your horses. If you got yourself a pasture, you need a tank for refilling the watering place. If you don't want to use my delivery service, you should buy a transporter. If you buy the large one, you might need a dolly to use it with a tractor. Otherwise, you need a truck. And that's all. Pigs. How do I feed pigs? To maintain the health of your pigs, you need to provide them with the right mix of feed. This mix is made out of base feed, grain, protein, and root crops. As base feed, you can use either corn or sorghum. I recommend wheat or barley as grains. You can do nothing wrong with soybeans, canola, or sunflowers as a protein source. Last but not least, just add some potatoes or sugar beets. If you want to keep it simple, you can also buy some pig feed. You don't need to use a mixing wagon. Those are required for cows. Just unload the right amount at your pigsty. How do I keep pigs? You need a pasture or a barn. Choose the size of the housing depending on how much you'd like to spend and how many pigs you want to keep. You need to deliver fresh water to your pig pasture, as it has no access to water. After placing one of the pastures, you can shape the area of the outdoor enclosure. What are the different kinds of breeds? There are a few breeds, such as German Landrace, Bentheim Black Pied, and Berkshire. They may look different, but they do not differ in matters of keeping pigs. Oh, and they are all very cute. What equipment do I need? Well, you definitely want a pasture or pigsty. If you have laid straw in the barn, the pigs will produce manure, and that must be stored. Get yourself a manure heap. If you want to spread manure on your fields, you need to buy a spreader and tank. Get yourself a tractor with a front loader attachment and a bale spike to deliver bales to the barn, as you need those to feed the piggies. Sheep. How do I feed sheep? Feeding sheep is quite simple. They like hay or grass. That's it. Just unload it at the feeding area of your barn or pasture. If you are growing grass in your fields, you can feed them fresh grass during summer. And for the cold winter months, you can use hay. How do I keep sheep? It may surprise you, but sheep need a pasture or a barn. Choose the size of the housing depending on how much you'd like to spend and how many sheep you want to keep. You need to deliver fresh water to your sheep pasture, as it has no access to water. So after placing one of the pastures or barns, you can shape the area of the outdoor enclosure. If you need slurry or manure, you need to keep pigs or cows, as sheep don't produce any. What are the different kinds of breeds? So there are quite a few colorful breeds of sheep. Landrace of Bentheim, Steinschaff, Swiss Black Brown Mountain, and Black Welsh Mountain. They may look different, but they do not differ in matters of keeping sheep. 
Oh, and they are all very cute and fluffy. What equipment do I need? Like I said, you definitely want a pasture or barn, as you don't want those hungry fellows to decimate your hard work. First, you need to get yourself a tractor with a front loader attachment and a bale spike to deliver bales to the barn, as you need those to feed your woolly friends. If you got yourself a sheep pasture, you need a tank for refilling the watering place. If you don't want to use my delivery service, you should buy a transporter. If you buy the large one, you might need a dolly to use it with a tractor. Otherwise, you need a truck. And that's all. Water buffaloes. How do I feed water buffaloes? You can feed your water buffaloes with grass, hay, or TMR. To keep your water buffaloes healthy and increase productivity, you shouldn't only feed them hay or grass. I've had the best results with TMR. If your farm relies heavily on milk production, especially in winter, you should always prepare enough quality food for them so they can be as productive as possible. How do I keep water buffalo? Water buffaloes, like all your animals, need a pasture or barn, depending on how much you'd like to spend and how many water buffaloes you want to keep. If you want to produce slurry or manure, you need at least a cow barn to collect it. You need to deliver fresh water to your pasture, as it has no access to water. After placing one of the pastures or barns, you can shape the area of the outdoor enclosure. What can I use water buffalo for? Water buffaloes are mainly used to produce milk. They start producing it at the age of 18 months. You can, of course, also keep them for breeding and selling for a profit. Reproduction also begins at the age of 18 months. What equipment do I need? Well, you definitely want to pasture or barn. Water buffaloes on your fields are not good for your yield. <laughs> if you have laid straw in the barn, the water buffaloes will produce manure, and that must be stored. Get yourself a manure heap. Water buffaloes produce slurry, too. It's collected in the liquid manure tank. If you want to spread manure and slurry on your fields, you need to buy a spreader and tank for each of the brown goods. Get yourself a tractor with a front loader attachment and a bale spike to deliver bales to the barn, as you need those to feed the water buffaloes. Then you should get yourself a tank to transport milk and water. Silage and TMR? What is silage and how do I produce it? Silage is a valuable feed that is preserved by fermentation. It cannot be directly grown on fields, but it can be made with grass or chaff. Chaff is made with a variety of crops, such as corn, wheat, barley, oat, sorghum, canola, soybeans, and sunflowers. If you decide to produce silage yourself, you may need additional equipment. When using grass, you need the equipment to cut down grass, a baler and bale wrapper. Press your mowed grass into packed bales and let those ferment. When using chaff, you definitely need some space, and of course a bunker silo. Then you should get yourself a forage harvester with a fitting header. Optionally, you can get a leveler attachment to even out the plant material while driving over it. Just harvest the crops before they reach maturity with a forage harvester. Unload the plant matter into a bunker silo, compress it, and let it ferment. Voila! That's how you make sauerkraut! Wait, silage and chaff. <laughs> what is TMR and how do I produce it? TMR is a high-quality food used to feed cattle. It is made with hay, silage, straw, and mineral feed. You can produce almost all ingredients yourself or buy them. To produce TMR, you need a forage mixer wagon to mix all the ingredients. Just fill in the right amount into your mixer and start mixing. And that's how you get wonderfully nutritious food for your cattle. Can I help you with something? Thanks, but right now I have everything under control myself. Well, well, look who it is. What's up? Tell me about yourself. Talking about me, huh? Yeah, sure, sure. Psst. I'm right in the middle of something. Goats! Goats! We got fresh goats! Who needs goats? How about you, good sir? May I interest you in acquiring some creatures with rectangular pupils?
I thought you were talking about you. <laughs> we are. My brother once called me a goat, so I'm right on topic. But seriously, we got more goats than we can handle alone this season, so we're looking for farmers looking to buy. If you've never thought about it, raising goats can provide some good profit. The milk alone is in high demand, and if you're involved with a production chain, you might not want to skip the opportunity. In addition, they're just fantastic animals and show fascinating behavior. I love their little faces because they always look so chill. There are many reasons why goats were among the first animals to be domesticated by humans. Depending on the source, some nine to 10,000 years ago, in case you didn't know that. Keep in mind, I can provide you with basic information on animal husbandry if you're not an expert yet. Anyway, get goats, pal. Really, thank me later. Tell me about yourself. If you don't need any important help, let's take a rain check. Tell me something interesting. Sure, just give me a second. I have to get my folder labeled interesting stuff. Have I told you about my time in the UK? I spent a couple of weeks on a nice little farm in Wales. Did you know that just under a third of the UK's sheep come from Wales? It's known for its wool production, and so I learned a thing or two about taking care of sheep. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the details of wool production right now. Instead, one of my favorite memories is of a cheeky little blackbird. While I was looking after the sheep, I noticed this blackbird hopping around in the enclosure where the cows were grazing. It was looking for materials for its nest and had decided that cows would make a wonderful supply. So it was flying from one to the next, plucking out their fur. <laughs> Some cows tried to shake it off, but the calves relaxing in the sun seemed to not care at all that they were already exploited for nest material. And with its tiny blackbird beak full of fur, the thief was flying back and forth. Unfortunately, it got a bit spooked when it saw me. Since then, I always try to leave out some nesting material for the local birds. Some food, too, even though they don't need it. What kind of materials do you leave behind? Mm, depends on what I have on hand. Usually small sticks, moss, chicken feathers, and a bit of hay. It's important to give them natural fibers and materials. And for them to eat. Some fruits, berries, or soft seeds and grains, like oats or poppy seeds, for example. Not that they need my help, but I like the idea of supporting them when I'm out for a relaxing walk. Anyway, I'm going for a walk with David soon, and need to find my little metal box of seeds to feed the birds. I'm sure you have a lot of things to accomplish today, too. Maybe some bird feeding. Tell me something interesting. If you don't need any important help, let's take a rain check. I need to go. Hey there, what can I do for you? Tell me about yourself. Sure, we could do that. Or I could tell you something about someone else. But first, let me start with an inquiry. May I interest you in some natural lawn mowing solutions? What do you mean? Okay, let me pitch you something. Ready? <clears throat> Are you fed up with starting up that rusty old lawn mower that scares the livestock? Are your arms too tired to swing around that scythe from days gone by? Worry not, fellow farmer. I've got just the thing for you. It's the ultimate eco-friendly alternative to traditional lawnmowers. Say goodbye to noisy fuel-guzzling machines and hello to sustainable, efficient, and charming lawn care. Fuzzy and cuddly when new, getting more productive with age. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I'm talking about cows here. Want to get some? Thing is, I planned a delivery to a farm in a nearby town. Turns out the poor farmer ran into some problems. Now I gotta find a new home for the cattle. Otherwise they'll eat up all the grass around here and they do eat quite a lot. I had to transfer them to one of David's tiny plots of land where they're grazing right now. I'll show him how to milk them and maybe he'll keep two or three of them, but I want to make sure he can handle them first. If one day you're interested in some lawnmowers that also produce dairy or can be sold for other purposes, let me know. I already have some, thanks. Maybe you want some more then. No pressure, though. Whenever you're ready, friend. You can order directly from the shop, by the way. And if you need some basic how-tos on cattle, you can come to me, too. But you know that already. Think about it. 
because only cow mowers are good mowers. Get yours while stocks last. Tell me about yourself. Sorry. Let's talk another time, okay? Tell me something interesting. Sure. Let's see. Did you know there's a time-traveling owl living in these woods? Come on, what are you talking about? Come on, keep up. An owl. It travels through time. Now, the owl. You need to know about the local legends. Otherwise, you're missing important community knowledge. Where was I? So, it's not like a time-traveling device. You hope to learn and get a share of its wisdom. Similar to your grandpa. <laughs> Many people report having come across a particular owl in the woods. Even outsiders not familiar with our myths and legends. If the owl deems you worthy, it will talk to you. If you're nice and show it respect in the conversation, it will share one of its wisdoms. It might tell you something from a past and long forgotten time that nobody else could know if they weren't there. Or it might share something from the future. Not specifically your future, so it might not be particularly beneficial to know. But you can be sure that there is always a lesson to learn. Noah swears he saw an owl that sounded like it wanted to talk to him. But he told the owl to be quiet because he was just enjoying his morning cup of coffee in the woods. I never met it, much to my dismay. David never met it, your grandpa can't remember any owls around here, and others just repeat what their relatives told them. Nobody here can actually confirm the legend. Why don't you go and look for it? Who knows, maybe you are worthy. Please don't tell it to keep quiet, that'd be a waste. Tell me something interesting. Something interesting? Let's see. Did you know there's a time-traveling owl living in these woods? I thought you animal farmers would be more serious. Pardon me if this topic fails to ascend to the lofty heights of seriousness you so evidently require. Would you rather receive an elaborate lecture including comparative analysis of fiber content and various livestock feeds and its effects? Now, the owl. You need to know about the local legends. Otherwise, you're missing important community knowledge. Where was I? So, it's not like a time-traveling div- What's up, friend? Tell me about yourself. Well, you know I love talking about myself. But let's see. I had an idea, and I'd like your opinion on it. You know, I've been thinking, and it's a pity to not share our farms and knowledge with others, don't you think? You're right. Anyway, that's why I had the idea to organize workshops on animal husbandry. There are farms out there that do that, and people love it. I still have to do all the boring stuff like market research and business plans, but let me tell you about the interesting part. I'd like to offer farm vacations where people could not only, very carefully, cuddle with the livestock, but learn how to tend to them, keeping them happy and healthy. People who want to become farmers, like David, for example, but also everyone else who's just interested, vacationers, school groups, anyone really. Also, I'd show them how to make some simple animal products and let them try it. We could start with a tour and people could participate here and there while learning about the history of our farm. Then guests split into groups based on interest. There could be a group in beekeeping outfits making honey or milking cows to make cheese. Others might want to hop onto a mower, harvest grass, and make bales for the animals to feed on. We could also do hikes where groups learn about local wildlife or go from one farm to another and try the products. At the end of the day, everyone would come together to socialize, eat dinner, and share what they learned, and maybe even produced. What do you think? Sounds interesting. I really think this could be super fun, and it's also a wonderful way to share this place with everyone. I'll let you know when I'm actually doing it. Hey, buddy. Nice to see you. Tell me about yourself. Right on. Let's chat. I'm currently training horses. One of our longtime clients has gone out of business, sadly. Meaning they won't buy horses like they did for the past three decades. I already have some other prospective buyers. But I try to avoid operating on speculation and hope alone. Thus, what about you? Want to get some horsies? 
interesting pitch. Sorry, just joking. <laughs> Mostly. You might want to learn a bit about horses one way or the other, whether you plan on using them on your farm or not. Thing is, specific horses have specific roles, especially today when they're not used as much as they were a hundred years ago. It comes down to their physical attributes and temperaments, based on breed, whether they're stallions, mares, or geldings, and other factors. Please keep in mind I'm simplifying here, okay? Sure, stallions might be used more for transport and other work like that due to their heightened strength and stamina. Their high-performance nature also makes them appealing for competitive sports like racing and show jumping. Or guarding herds because of their protective and territorial nature. And yes, mares and geldings are used for that too. But since they tend to have more, well, predictable, even-tempered personalities, they are more often used for therapeutic and educational roles too. Training other horses with them is cool already, but don't you think it's awesome that horses are used for therapy with humans, too? We don't have foals here, though. If you were looking for some, I have to disappoint you. Our horses apparently reproduce through mitosis. I'm still wondering how we managed to evade the hordes of scientists. Anyway, horses are important, valuable creatures. And when I say valuable, I'm not just talking about their financial value. Although there's a reason why horse breeding is quite lucrative. Just wanted you to know... Tell me something interesting. Sure. Hmm. Something interesting. Well, did someone already tell you why we love black cats around here? Uh, nobody did. Then someone really should. There is a myth around here of a black cat roaming around these parts every few years. If it decides to become your barn cat, you will be blessed and have a plentiful harvest. When we were children, my brother found a small black kitten in the barn. He named it Peanut. She was the friendliest cat I've ever known, and while we had her, we all had unusual amounts of luck. One summer, Peanut followed my father to the orchard. Apparently, she was running around the apple trees wildly meowing. It was almost otherworldly. My father, superstitious as he is, decided to prepare the trees for frost just in case. And lo and behold, that night the temperatures fell quite dramatically. But, due to Peanut and Dad's foresight, the harvest was saved. Another time, the night before my brother was up for a running competition, Peanut crawled into his bed at night and suckled on his feet. Cats do that sometimes, but Peanut did it vigorously. Usually, he never made the podium during those competitions, but that day, he came in first place. Ran like never before, and never again. He even washed his feet twice a day so Peanut would do it again. She didn't, though. Probably the most luck Peanut gave us was when my sister and I were jumping around on the hay bales in the barn. Peanut was loudly meowing outside, and when we went to look for her, a beam from the roof collapsed right on top of the bales we were playing on. Our mother really gave us an earful afterward because we were playing in there. I really miss that cat. It is very weird we don't have any cats in town anymore. I wonder where they went. It seems like every cat followed Peanut into the cat dimension and just vanished. Well, the cat dimension is a story for another time. Tell me something interesting. The animals are waiting for me, so let's continue another time? Hello, hello. Tell me something interesting. Sure. Hmm. Something interesting. Have I told you about my time in the UK? I spent a couple of weeks on a nice little farm in Wales. Did you know that just under a third of the UK's sheep come from Wales? It's known for its wool production, and so I learned a thing or two about taking care of sheep. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the details of wool production right now. Instead, one of my favorite memories is of a cheap... While I was looking after the sheep, I noticed this black... It was looking for materials... So it was flying from one. Some cows tried, and with its tiny. Since then, I always try to leave out some nesting material for the local birds. What do blackbirds Some eat? food too. Oh, well, that depends. Usually insects, fruits, and berries. Small, soft seeds and grains like oats or poppy seeds, for example. Not that they need my help, 
but I like the idea of supporting them when I'm out for a relaxing walk. Anyway, I'm going for a walk with David soon, and need to find my little metal box of seeds to feed the birds. I'm sure you have a lot of things to accomplish today, too. Maybe some bird feeding. Tell me about yourself. About myself? <laughs> I'm flattered, but I'm sure there's lots of other stuff that's way more interesting. I have a really important question to ask. What's your favorite dinosaur? I'm not sure. For one thing, dinosaurs are cool. And the other thing is asking people about their favorite dinosaur seems to be the latest icebreaker in conversations. At least according to David. So I'm verifying this thesis by asking you now. His favorite is the T-Rex. Of course it is. Men. But let me tell you something about myself and my sister Monica. My sister and I, we grew up with animals on the farm, as you probably know by now. No dinosaurs, though. Only chickens, but close enough. There are a lot of reasons why people want to work with animals when they're children, and why they actually do it when they grow up. For us, there were many reasons, too. Besides our family business, I mean. One of them was Dr. Eliza Satley. Do you know her? No, I don't. She's one of the most influential and important female characters in movie history. It's the dinosaur doctor from Dino Sanctuary. You know, the original, when they had the smart characters doing the right things instead of the goofy ones doing the wrong things for dramatic effect. The scene where she bravely rescues an ankylosaurus is what made her one of my and my sister's main role models. Probably one of the main reasons why my sister became a veterinarian, too and did daily medical rounds in the chicken coop to make sure our dinosaurs were healthy. After watching the movie for the sixth time in one single day one summer, she never wanted to be anything else. Me, on the other hand, settled for supporting a wide range of animal rescue programs around the world and took over the family business. But if it wasn't for Dr. Setley, I probably would have been less enthusiastic about actually working with animals when I was still a kid. Time to rewatch the movie. <laughs> I told David about it, but he's more of a fan of the new ones. Says they're more relatable. Oh, David, honey. But he sent me a dinosaur postcard yesterday with a tiny baby dinosaur saying, "Rar." <laughs> it's really cute. If you're bored sometime, maybe you should watch the movie too. It's still as awesome as it was back in the 90s. Tell me about yourself. Sorry to disappoint, but I gotta go soon. What's up, friend? Tell me about yourself. Sure, we could do that. Or I could tell you something about someone else. Well, my nephew's birthday is coming up, and I've been thinking about what to get him. He's been obsessed with Rosie the Cow. He takes after me in that regard, as Rosie has been an inspirational role model to me. Did you have a favorite book series as a kid? Uh, who's Rosie the Cow? Just one of the most wonderful book characters ever. Rosie is this stuffed cow plushie with a yellow raincoat and a small umbrella. In the original story, she was left on a plane by her human, and that was the start of her travels. The book series follows her shenanigans around the world, and she's mostly visiting farms and talking to farmers and their families. She sends her human postcards from her travel destinations and tells them about her adventures and what she learned on the farms. Rosie is a bit of a klutz, and tends to get into trouble because of a ridiculous amount of misunderstandings. However, since she has a very kind nature and the help of numerous friends, everything is resolved by the end. Of course it is. They're children's stories. The series has been around ever since I was a child, and just like my nephew, I was obsessed with it. That's probably why I decided fairly early on that when I was going to be an adult, I was going to travel the world like Rosie. Raincoat and umbrella in tow, of course. My sister has an album of all the postcards I sent my family. And my brother is still sulking when she shows it, because she got more addressed to her than him. <laughs> well, that reminds me. I have to go look after my cows. Hopefully none of them started to travel without my approval. Like that smart water buffalo does all the time. See you around, friend. Tell me something interesting. Sure, just give me a second. I have to get my folder labeled interesting stuff. Have you ever woken up being surrounded by a bunch of cats? Uh, no. Hmm, interesting. 
I actually took you for quite the cat magnet. Well, let me tell you a cute story. It happened to me while I was visiting a friend from my university days in Japan. We went to an island famous for its crazy cat population. They outmatch the humans like three to one. My friend Hinato is supporting a vet care program for these cats since he's a veterinarian. So we were scoping out the island and trying to get a feel of what would be needed, talking to the locals. Okay, Hinato was. I was looking around for a place to sit down, as my Japanese is a bit... non-existent. <laughs> Didn't take long to find a cozy looking spot. The sound of waves crashing, insects humming, and a nice breeze from the sea that stretched on the horizon. What's not to like? As it had been quite a long day, I thought, I'll just take a quick break. And I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that I fell asleep. The people of the island probably found me quite rude, but it wasn't humans who woke me up. It was an insistent nudging of a paw on my face. I opened my eyes and was surrounded by about 20 cats, maybe 30. A few had decided I made a perfect napping spot and others were just watching me. Of course, I had to accept my fate as a cat cushion. Hinato found me shortly after. I've seldom seen a person laugh so exceedingly at another's predicament. It took a while before he freed me. <laughs> the calico kitten that nudged me followed us around and Hinato noticed that it actually needed some attention to its leg. He took the cat with him, nursed her back to health, and then he was the proud owner of a cat. You know how it goes. You don't get to decide if you want to live with a cat. They decide. Her name is Rin, and she should be about five years old now. Now that I think about it, it's kind of weird we don't have any cats around here, don't you think? Yeah. Strange. Hmm. Maybe it's a glitch in the grand design. <laughs> Just joking. I think I've been hanging out with David too much. Well, that's how it is. Maybe one day some will settle down here. Hey there, what can I do for you? Tell me something interesting. Of course. Consider me a well of stories and mischief. You've noticed crows on the fields around here, right? It is said that some of them are not like the others but they hide in plain sight between the other crows, so you don't notice them. What are you talking about? One of our local legends, of course. So I never have gotten close enough to confirm the myths that are spun around the crows flying around town. Apparently they whisper, constantly whispering interesting things that only they observe, and even the townsfolk aren't gossiping about. You can only hear what they're whispering when you get close to them. Or rather, if they choose to let you come close enough. <laughs> they probably won't. Believe me, I tried. If you can get close to them and catch what they're whispering about, you'd be the first to do so. A lot of people swear they can hear the indistinguishable, almost otherworldly murmuring, but not what they're actually saying. You just want me to run after crows for no reason? Who, me? I'm an upstanding citizen who would never do something as mischievous as that. Whether it's true or not, if you want to know something definitely real about crows, I'll not let you go empty-handed. It's actually true that crows can mimic a variety of sounds. Yes, even humans. My grandmother once told me that that's where the idea of ghosts comes from. I haven't found any sources to support that statement, but it's a nice thought. Back to the facts. Crows can also mimic sounds of other birds or animals, or human-made objects like car alarms. As crows are highly clever, the smartest of them use this ability to trick us. Some of us, at least. If you look closely, there's a crow following David around sometimes. Well, I hope you learned something today. Thanks for listening. Class is over. Well, well, look who it is. What's up? Right on. I was reminded of a nice story yesterday. Some chickens escaped their coop, so I spent yesterday afternoon trying to get them back. But first, what about you? I heard you've been busy as a bee, and your farm has been coming along quite nicely. Yeah, I've been making progress. That's good to hear. 
hopefully you don't have to run around chasing chickens like me. <laughs> Thankfully I got them all. I think. Maybe if you see some rogue chicken, come and see me. Except if it's blue. Then you should keep some feed on your windowsill tonight. A uh, blue chicken? I see you're a bit confused. <laughs> it's a local myth. You see, there was this farm decades ago. The family owning it made a good living and everything went well. Until a big storm hit. Gusts of wind were whipping dangerously through the valley on that day. Then it was raining cats and dogs. The amount of water was going to flood the farm eventually. The farmer tried his best to get his animals to safety, but as you can imagine, they were all in a panic, humans and animals. When all seemed lost, rescue came in the form of a blue rooster. It was just standing there on a single pole of a fence that was destroyed by the storm. It let out a powerful crow, which snapped everyone out of their panic. Even the animals seemed to calm down in the middle of a storm. The family managed to lead every single one of their livestock to a nearby hill to wait it out. Thankfully, the damage to the farm wasn't too big, and they managed to repair everything with the help of the neighbors. The rooster was hailed as a savior, although it was never seen again. And ever since then, if you see a blue chicken, you're supposed to leave some feed outside so that the heroic rooster blesses your farm and saves it from natural disasters. You're pulling my leg, right? <laughs> well, I told you it's a myth. Whether it's true or not, it is a nice story, isn't it? Unfortunately, I have an appointment with the veterinarian now. Some mares are expecting. I'll tell you another story soon. See you around. Talking about me, huh? Yeah, sure, sure. I have a question for you. Do you know why your great uncle Paul asked me if I could sell him dozens of chickens? That is exactly what he seemed up to. He said something about a traveling petting zoo and the beach. I'm not entirely sure what his exact business idea was. To be frank, I'm not going to sell him any chickens. He did not seem to have thought about the logistics. Like, how does he plan to transport them, and how does he plan to capture them after setting them free on the beach? This is quite stressful for the animals. Not to mention all the things that can happen on the beach where hundreds of people are running around, playing, and doing all kinds of mischief. <sighs> I know. Your grandpa also told me about a sugar beet stand and other things that your uncle did over the last couple of decades. You know, bringing people and animals together isn't that bad of an idea, but I don't think that is the way to do it. I was thinking about organizing some workshops on our farm for folks who would like to dip their toes into animal husbandry. I can ask him if he would like to attend. That would keep him and the chickens safe. <laughs> Maybe he'll learn something at his age. And he might drop ideas like that because they're not realistic or too much of a hassle for him anyway. You can ask me any time about the basics. Come to me any time you want to learn something about animal husbandry. Okay, I have to feed the chickens now. I'll also count them in case there's one missing. See you. What's up? Yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff about me. You know what's great about keeping sheep? You can make your own pillows. Warm, fluffy, comfortable pillows stuffed with wool. Not that I keep them because of that. I don't own a pillow shop, but it's a nice side effect if you know how to make them. Back when I traveled through the UK, I stopped on a cattle farm and learned from a delightful old woman and her sister how to stuff a pillow. They did that for the past 60 years. Can you believe that? Among other things, of course. Obviously, you can't just shear a sheep and stuff the wool right into a pillowcase. There's a whole process behind it when you do it professionally. It needs to be gently cleaned first. On the farm, it went through a process of hot water and biodegradable soap. To get rid of leftover plant material and whatnot, it was then combed with a special machine that made the wool so fluffy you wouldn't believe. After it was clean and dry, it was ready to be stuffed into a pillowcase. I still have one I got to keep. Oh, the fluffiness, I tell you. Anyway, how about breeding some sheep on your farm? Or is your pillow comfy enough? Don't we all? You should get a new pillow every few years anyway, depending on the material. 
If you're interested sometime, I can help you with the basics of keeping sheep. Just ask me for help. We don't have a pillow factory around here, but other companies are in steady need of wool, so you can make a good profit. Also, you could make David a new pillow, as he complained about his cheap polyester pillow. I'd do it, but I have to take care of a little lamb in need. Nothing beats a proper wool pillow. I prefer them over feathers, even. Wool pillows are hypoallergenic, and their temperature regulation is excellent for a good night's sleep. And the best thing about wool pillows? They are resistant to dust mites. So think about wool pillows, keeping sheep, and don't let the dust mites bite you when you go to sleep, buddy.